Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Tax Reform and Its Impact on Private Schools. I've got a few housekeeping items to go over before we get started. You can maximize or minimize the webinar pane during the presentation by using the red or orange arrow buttons. During the webinar, we also encourage you to ask questions. In the webinar pane, you'll see a questions box that you can use to type in those questions. Just type them in and click Submit and we'll get to them either during the webinar as time allows or at the end. Next up, your audio settings. To ensure good audio quality, please check your settings. If you're using a telephone, please click on the phone call audio option. If you're listening through the computer, then please click on the computer audio option. Now a quick review of CPE requirements. To qualify for CPE, you must use a personal computer, no smartphones, and log in with your own information and unique URL. You must be logged into our online software for at least 50 consecutive minutes within the scheduled time frame of the webinar. Actively respond to at least 75% of the polling questions. There are four, which means you need to answer three, and complete the evaluation survey at the end of the webinar. And a quick review of our learning objectives. Today, we're going to review the direct and indirect impact of the CAP Tax Cuts and Jobs Act on private schools, discuss how this will affect charitable giving preferences and evaluate how our private schools can plan for the future. And with that, I'll turn it over to Martha, who is a good friend of the firm, and Cal Boas, our co-host of this afternoon's webinar. To you, Martha. Uh, thank you. Um, a lot of energy was focused in the fall and early in the winter on uh, the tax reform proposals that were in Congress. And that focus and effort was successful in that many of the items that would have directly and negatively impacted our schools uh, did not end up in the final version that was passed. But a lot of questions remain about what actually did and did not make it into the final legislation and what the implications for independent schools um, and particularly independent schools in California, given that our state has special laws and its tax structure and a political climate um, that leaves some questions open about um, how California is going to look at some of these tax changes. So, since I'm not an expert in tax law, I welcome the partnership with Armanino, and I want to take just a minute to introduce the two people that are going to be guiding us through this. Many of you probably know Dean. Um, Dean uh, works with many private schools, many in California, and um, he's a resource to us here and to many of you. And also Katie Brown, who is a CPA, and she's a senior manager at Armanino. And um, Katie has a focus and an expertise in taxation, and she works with many exempt organizations. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Katie. Great, thank you so much. Um, we've got, uh, oh, we skipped one. Okay, so um, we're gonna be talking about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act today, uh, which was passed on December 22nd, 2017. And it's the first major update to US tax legislation since the 1986 Tax Reform Act. And uh, the stated goals of this act were to simplify the tax code and reduce the tax burden on the middle class, um, and hopefully also to encourage domestic corporate activity by giving a number of tax benefits to corporations. Whether this actually ends up simplifying the tax code is up for discussion. And uh, we'll be looking at some of these specific provisions that relate to schools. Um, the majority of the items in this act go into effect for tax years that are that begin in 2018. So it will be your 2018 tax forms. And your 2017 tax returns are not going to be affected. All of those are still going to be under the previous law. Uh, there are very few provisions that are actually permanent in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, the majority of the individual provisions are going to sunset in 2025. Um, and really the only major permanent ones are the corporate changes. So we first wanted to go over just a couple of items that were discussed early on, but that 
did not end up being included in the final version of the bill. So these items did generate a lot of worry and discussion, and we just wanted to point out which ones didn't change so that we can hopefully put your mind at ease, at least on a few things. Uh, first, we've got qualified tuition reductions. These will remain non-taxable to the employee recipient, and that includes tuition remission for employees of schools and graduate student tuition waivers. The Section 127 provision for the non-taxability of certain employer educational assistance payments to employees remains intact. The student loan interest deduction and all the major education credits remained untouched in the final version. Housing for the convenience of the employer remains non-taxable to employees. And in order for it to be for the convenience of the, of the employer, just as a reminder, it has to be a condition of employment and has to be for the convenience of the employer and on site or within a mile of the employer's campus. So those are the, the basic requirements for it to be excluded from income for the recipient. And that's still- and Katie, we know that Okay, we know that we get a lot of questions on that. So if you want to circle back on that, please reach out to us. But head of school housing is always a is, a, is always a question. So please feel free to reach out to Katie or myself on that. Yes. Um, so draft versions of the bill also would have eliminated the tax exempt nature of 501c3 private activity bonds. But this provision was removed from the final bill. So we are still allowed to have private activity bonds. And draft versions also proposed to make the charitable mileage deduction the same as it is for business mileage, which is 53.5 cents per mile. But this proposal didn't survive in the final bill, so we remain at 14 cents per mile for charitable purposes. And then there was a lot of buzz around the potential repeal of the Johnson Amendment, which prohibits charitable organizations from political campaign activity because of the wide-reaching effects it could have had. In the end, the Johnson Amendment was not repealed, so charitable organizations are still not allowed to endorse candidates for elected office. So those are some of the major items that we heard a lot of people talking about, and we wanted to make sure that you knew there was no change there. We'll move to our first polling question. Thanks, Katie. First polling question. Have you received questions about parents or donors, or from, probably from parents or donors, about the new tax law? A, yes, B, no. And for those of you wondering if we'll be sharing versions of the slide deck or recording, the answer is yes. Uh, Martha or myself will be sending out a link and a copy of the deck following the webinar. Get those polling question answers in for CPE. We'll close the polls in three, two, and one. Looks pretty 50-50 split there. Yeah, that is pretty close. Um, mostly leaning towards no a little bit, but that's okay. I'm sure they will be coming. So one of the first items we wanted to talk about was new rules for unrelated business income. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act created a new portion of Section 512, which is 512A6, and it provides that unrelated business taxable income must be determined separately for each separate trade or business activity conducted by an exempt organization, and that losses from one UBI activity may not offset net income from another UBI activity. This rule is also going to apply to net operating losses incurred in 2018 tax years and later, so net operating loss carryovers will also have to be tracked separately by business activity. So for an organization with more than one unrelated business or, or sorry, more than one unrelated trade or business, the new provision requires that net income from each activity be computed separately and without regard to the $1,000 specific deduction, which is available to all 990T filers. Net losses from one activity cannot offset income from another and net operating losses will be siloed by activity. However, net operating losses will still be allowed and will be carried forward to future years to offset income from the activity that generated it. Under a special transition rule, net operating losses that were in place in tax years before 2018 will still be able to be applied to all net income from unrelated business activities. So it's only newly incurred net operating losses in 2018 or later that have to be siloed by business activity. 
We don't yet know the level of granularity that will be required in separating business activities, but at this point, we're considering the activity of being a partner in an investment partnership as one activity. So until we get further guidance, we're not siloing individual K-1s for those of you that invest in K-1s and may have unrelated business income that flows through. So we're still planning to net all unrelated business income from K-1 partnership activities, but we will be alert for guidance that may come in the future that could specify how to treat partnership activity specifically. So this well, could generate, I, when, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Katie, I was just gonna say, I know that when I think about unrelated business income for our schools, I think about rental income, I think about potentially rental income on real estate, I think about advertising or sponsorship mm -hmm. revenue, and I also think about, like you said, those K-1s from investments. So if anybody has any of those, um, this, this could apply to you. Yes. Those are the most typical ones that we see um, lots of times advertising, maybe from yearbook sales, if it's um, ads rather than sponsorships. Um, and yes, debt financed income from rentals and things like that are, are the types of activities that will have to be separated in future years. Let's move to the reduced unrelated business income tax rate for corporations. So the other significant change to unrelated business income reporting is that the corporate tax rates have changed from a tiered system to a flat 21% tax. Unlike other provisions in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, this is a permanent change unless Congress decides to make further changes in the coming years, but as of now it is permanent. Congress imposes UBI or the tax on unrelated business incomes to put exempt organizations that participate in revenue generating business activities that are outside of their exempt purpose on the same footing as taxable businesses engaged in the same types of activities. So the corporate tax rates and AMT rules will apply to schools with unrelated business activities. As you can see from the old table, schools with lower amounts of taxable income will actually have a higher effective rate of tax under the new law. The break-even point is at about $90,000 in taxable income, which under the old rates had an effective tax rate of 20.944%. So we show an example here of the actual tax liability on $5,000 in unrelated business income, which under the old tiered rates was $750, and under the new flat rate would be $1,050. So there is an increase there, and as a percentage, it is significant. And the numbers are small, but the percentage can be significant in certain cases. Additionally, the corporate alternative minimum tax has been repealed, so there are no levels of income that the flat 21% rate will not apply to. All, all income levels will have just a flat 21% rate. Net operating losses will no longer be limited by the effect of AMT, although as we mentioned on the last slide, NOLs will be limited to the business activity that generated them. And this is effective for tax years beginning in 2018 and later. So it will affect calendar year entities this year and fiscal year entities for the 1819 tax year, which means that for most of you, you've got another few months before the first affected tax year begins. If you expect to have a tax liability for unrelated business income in the 2018 tax year, it's important to calculate and pay quarterly estimated taxes to both the IRS and the FTB in order to avoid underpayment penalties and interest at the end of the year especially with the long extension period afforded to exempt organizations, interest on tax underpayments can become significant if we don't look at it until tax return preparation time. So be sure to reach out to your tax advisor this year if you expect to have a tax liability on unrelated business activities. We've got some changes to employee compensation rules to go over next. And some of these will affect you, uh, some of you significantly, others, it may be completely out of the range of possibility, but we'll go over what the rules are here. And if you have any questions, again, you can always reach out to us. So the first one that we're gonna talk about is a new tax on excess compensation, uh, which is considered to be over $1 million. So the new tax code now makes two types of executive compensation taxable to the employer remuneration of over $1 million for the year and excess parachute payments, which we'll cover next. Section 4960 states that amounts in excess of $1 million paid to a covered employee 
are subject to an excise tax at the UBI tax rate for the organization. So this will be that flat 21% corporate rate. The excise tax is levied against the school employer, uh, but unlike some similar provisions in the code for taxable companies, there's no penalty or additional tax imposed on the employee. The tax penalty falls on the employer, which means that board compensation committees should be aware of this rule and its potential impact on their organizations. So a covered employee is one of the five highest compensated employees of the school for the 2017 tax year and any subsequent years. So it does, this look back goes back to 2017. So this would typically be your head of school or president, CFO, or other officers. And once the person becomes a covered employee in one tax year, they will continue to be considered a covered employee in all future years. So if they were you know, CEO and then they come back in a later year in, in a different capacity, or maybe even they come back as the head of school in a later year, uh, they're still going to be considered a covered employee. Remuneration includes wages, but not to the extent that they're designated Roth contributions or contributions to a qualified deferred compensation plan, like a 403B or a 457B. So it's wages plus any non-qualified deferred compensation that vests to the employee during the year under something like a 457F plan. You would typically include those amounts in the employee's W-2 anyway, but it is important to note that vesting schedules for non-qualified plans can potentially trigger this excess compensation tax in a year where you might otherwise not expect to compensate an officer over $1 million. So you wanna look at the vesting schedules. Remuneration does not include the value of non-taxable benefits provided to the employee, like medical and dental insurance, um, and the, it also excludes the value of excluded housing. So it's really only looking at taxable wages that go through the employee's W-2. Payments from related persons or organizations have to be aggregated each year to determine whether the $1 million threshold has been surpassed. So if you have a separate auxiliary organization that pays part of your executive salaries and the school pays the other part, you would need to add those together to evaluate the employee's total remuneration for purposes of Section 4960. And there are several limitations and exceptions to this rule. For example, it specifically excludes payments to medical or veterinary professionals for their medical services and fees paid to a public official. So there are some others, but the, the main gist of it is that if you've got a regular employee whose taxable compensation in a year exceeds a million dollars, there's going to be a tax on the school for the amount that exceeds a million. Our next provision is excess parachute payments. So section 4960 also imposes an excise tax at UBI tax rates or 21% on exempt organizations who pay excess parachute payments. A payment will be considered a parachute payment if it is related to separation from employment and the present value of the payment and any future payment or property transfer is greater than three times the employee's base amount. This will also include loan forgiveness amounts. For example, if the head of school's compensation package included a forgivable loan for housing or education or possibly relocation, the remaining amount is forgiven as part of the severance package. Uh, we would have to include the present value of the forgiven amount, including interest, when determining if there was a parachute payment. The base amount is the employee's average salary or wages for the past five years. So significant bonuses or other large income items in the five-year look-back period can affect the calculated base amount in the year of separation from service. So once you've determined that you do have a parachute payment, the amount that is considered excess and taxable is the amount that exceeds the employee's base amount. So we've got two examples here. In the first one, we're looking at a head of school and the base amount when we looked back over the last five years, the average compensation was $200,000. The severance package is valued at $700,000. So we see that $700,000 is more than three times $200,000. So the entire thing is considered a parachute payment and the amount that's subject to the excise tax is the amount that exceeds the base amount. So that's $500,000. Now in example two, we're gonna have the same severance package of $700,000, but this head of school's base amount is 500,000. So when we look back at the previous five years, it averages to 500,000. 
In this case, there's no parachute payment because the severance does not exceed the base amount by three times or more. So there's no excise tax on that severage pa severance package of 700,000 in the second example. So you can see that what the IRS considers to be excessive is relative, and it depends on the employee's salary history. And the same amount of money paid to two different people can have very different tax consequences. And again, the penalty falls on the school, not the employee. So it is an important consideration in setting compensation and determining severance arrangements. And our last and strangest provision relating to employee compensation is new section 512A7, which was created as an analog to section 274 for taxable corporations. Section 274 disallows several employee benefit provisions that existed under previous law, and Section 512A7 requires tax-exempt organizations to pay UBIT on those same expenses. So depending on how these benefits are structured, nonprofit schools will have to pay tax on the amount that they spend on specified employee commuting and parking benefits. So previously, employer costs for qualified transportation fringe benefits qualified employee parking benefits, and on-premises athletic facilities could be excluded from employee income under Section 132 without requiring the employee to demonstrate related costs. So for example, under Section 132F, employers could cover several employee commuting costs as fringe benefits, and they didn't have to include that amount in the employee's taxable income. You could exclude up to $175 per month for transit passes, up to $175 per month for employee commuter parking, and up to $20 per month for qualifying bicycle commuting expenses. And Section 274 now disallows those expenses as business deductions for taxable companies, and Section 512A7 requires nonprofits to pay tax on the amount they spend for those expenses. So qualified transportation fringe benefits include public transit passes, carpool or vanpool expenses, qualified employee parking, and any qualified bicycle commuting expenses. Employers may continue to offer and pay for these benefits, but the excise tax will apply to those amounts paid. These new rules target employer paid benefits that represent an employee's personal costs for commuting and parking to get to work, which are typically not tax deductible to the employee when they pay for it themselves. So this is kind of closing a, a a loophole that existed in the previous, and it wasn't really a loophole because it was designed to be this way, but if you, it was a special exception that they've basically taken away at this point. <clears throat> so the main exception for this is going to be commuting costs covered by employers under an accountable plan, under which eligibility for the plan does not skew in favor of highly compensated employees or executives. The employee pays for the expense themselves and submits proof of expenses to the employer for reimbursement, and if the employer's reimbursements exceed the employee's costs, the employee has to pay back the excess to the employer. So it's really a direct reimbursement plan. We see many employers offering this type of benefit through a Section 125 cafeteria plan, and that would still be allowable under the new law. The rules for on-premises athletic facilities relate to facilities operated by the employer on its premises when substantially all the users of the facility are employees, their spouses, and their dependent children. So this will not affect student athletic facilities at schools, which are part of the school's organizational, or sorry, educational purpose, and are designed for student use. Nor would it affect other organizations that operate athletic facilities as part of their mission, such as a YMCA or a JCC. In the rare situation that your school pays these expenses as direct costs of an unrelated business activity, it may still take them as a deduction against unrelated business income, and those amounts would also not be subject to the excise tax. None of these rules apply to business-related parking or transportation costs, such as when you pay for an employee's parking at a client site. It's really looking at employee benefits and commuting costs. We're hoping to get a little bit more guidance on these items in the coming months, but um, we'll, we'll definitely share those as we get more information. Sorry, I was looking at a question here. Polling question. Perfect. Thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. Second polling question. Does your school offer parking benefits for school employees? A, yes, B, no, or C, not sure. Get those answers in. 
And as a reminder, we will be sending around a recording and a copy of the slide presentation. I know we're covering a lot of material today. We'll close the polls in three, two, and one. Looks like the majority are saying no, but some say yes, and some just aren't sure. Yes, yes. That could be something. It seems like a lot of schools have their own um, parking facilities for employees, and so it doesn't affect them as much unless you're in more of an urban area where you might need to have employees who are parking or using public transportation to get to work. Uh, there are a couple questions that I just wanted to go over really quickly. Um, Jennifer asked, are there any changes around car leases for heads? No, no changes to that. Um, still the same rules will apply. Lots of times that's going to be a taxable expense, but it, it depends on how it's structured, but no changes in the law to that. And then if you are receiving a commuting benefit, the employee would pay a tax. No, this is going to be an a tax on the employer who pays for this type of benefit. So you can structure it as an accountable plan and not worry about having a tax imposed. But if you are just paying for these expenses and excluding it from employee compensation without an accountable plan, that's the amount that they're gonna wanna tax. So for tax exempt financing, we have one major change. Um, Tax exempt organizations may apply for and receive tax exempt bond financing to build out their facilities. And they have two options for refinancing if they choose to do that at some point. And it is called refunding in the bond world. And it can be either a current or an advanced refunding. In a current refunding, the old bond is paid off within 90 days of the new bond being issued. In an advanced refunding, the old bond isn't paid off for more than 90 days after the new funds are issued. The new tax code denies tax exempt treatment for advanced refunding bonds, which eliminates the opportunity to hold two tax exempt bonds for the same property for more than 90 days. The IRS generally wants to limit an exempt organization's ability to generate more income on bond funds than the interest rate of the bond. So eliminating the advanced refunding option has the effect of removing exotic investment schemes that could capitalize on having this large dollar amount that they've taken from tax exempt financing. Interest on current refunding bonds continues to be excludable from income for individual investors and most tax exempt organizations and their lenders that we've spoken with generally prefer current refunding options. So this probably won't have a huge impact on schools, uh, but if you had considered maybe doing an advance refunding, unfortunately that's not gonna be available anymore. And just a couple of quick reminders for bondholders while I have you as a captive audience, which is kind of my, uh, I'm very interested in making sure people are aware of their, their bond compliance requirements. Um, Section 149 reporting rules require all holders of um, all types of tax exempt financing, whether it's technically called a loan or a bond. So if you've got tax exempt loan funds, that's still gonna be considered bond and it has to be reported on a Schedule K if you've got more than $100,000 of tax exempt financing at, on your balance sheet at the year end. Um, business use of bond finance facilities by parties other than the school itself have to be limited to 5% of the total amount of the facilities financed by the bond. Non-compliance with this rule makes the entire bond issue no longer tax exempt, so it's really important. Other 501c3 organizations with the same mission as the school may use the facilities, but private individuals or companies or even nonprofits with a different mission may not. This includes activities like summer camps, a parent who may offer financial planning services in a classroom after hours, a tutoring company that offers services in the school's library, et cetera. So no one else may use your bond finance facilities to generate income. And then my third point, if you have bond funds in a sinking fund or other interest bearing account for any period of time, you need to review your total income on those funds every five years and pay over any excess above the bond's interest rate back to the government. And this has obviously not been an issue recently because we've had very low interest rates, but as interest rates continue to rise in the future, that's something that we may need to consider more carefully. Um, so the IRS doesn't allow tax exempt bondholders to make income on bond funds and they call that arbit arbitrage and they require bondholders to examine their income and pay it over every five years if in excess of the bond rate. So just as a reminder for those of you with tax exempt financing. And now on to the really big one that everybody is interested in, which is section 529 plans. 
Section 529 plans, as I'm sure all of you know, are tax advantage savings vehicles designed to pay for qualified higher education expenses. And contributions to the plan are made after tax. And while some states offer state income tax deduction for 529 contributions, California is not one of those states, one of the very few that doesn't. The contributions grow tax-free and distributions from the plan are tax-free as long as they're used for qualifying expenses. The TCJA has expanded the code's definition of qualified education expenses to include both the originally described post-secondary expenses and elementary and secondary school tuition for public, private, and religious schools. While higher education expenses are not limited and may include things like books, fees, and in some cases a computer, the only qualifying expense at the K-12 through level is tuition. And while there is no limit on the amount that can be withdrawn for higher education expenses, parents may only withdraw $10,000 per year per student for K-12 through tuition expenses. And please note that the limitation is per beneficiary, not per plan. So even if this... Uh, Sorry, even if the student has multiple 529 plans, they may only use $10,000 per year to pay for K through 12 tuition. So the source of funds that a parent uses to pay tuition is not something that a school needs to inquire about or track, and schools do not need to provide any kind of special acknowledgement or anything to parents who say they're using 529 plan funds when they pay their tuition. In fact, it's important that schools do not offer tax advice to parents and that you direct them back to their own tax advisors when they have questions about using their funds or what happens if they over withdraw or any sort of questions like that. Excess withdrawals will be handled by the plan administrator and do not affect schools at all. The parent will owe tax on the excess earnings they withdrew and will pay a penalty for early withdrawal. But again, that's not something you as a school administrator need to worry about or advise on and just keep pointing them back to their own tax advisors. We've had lots of questions about how or whether schools should look at 529 plan assets uh, now for determining financial need when evaluating for financial aid. And this is more of a school policy question than a matter of law, and there are a variety of considerations that you may weigh in making that decision. The main benefit of the plan is the long-term tax-free growth that hopefully accumulates to increase funding available for a student's higher education expenses. So if parents withdraw funds earlier, they forego future tax-free earnings and also reduce the nest egg available for their students' higher education expenses. In reality, for California families, I think the main benefit offered by this change is that it can help parents who experience a really bad financial year keep their student in the same school without turning to debt or liquidating other assets in order to afford tuition, and it would be more of a short-term solution. Most parents who pay for private school tuition expect their kids to go to college, so they may be reluctant to tap into and reduce the long-term benefits offered by 529 plan savings. And I also had a question earlier, even before we started, that said, um, what is California, uh, how is California addressing the provision for 529 plans and their application to independent schools? Um, California hasn't said anything about that yet, and I don't think there's going to be any change. It was never a tax deduction on your state tax return for California anyway, and so there's not, I, I don't expect there to be any changes to the way that they're handling it. Cool. Thanks, Katie. On to polling question number three. Um, do you think 529 plan funds should be considered when determining financial aid eligibility for students? A, yes, B, no, or C, not sure. And get those answers in. As a reminder, if you skipped a question for CPE, make sure you answer this one. This is the third of the four polling questions. We'll close the poll in three, two, and one. Looks like the majority are saying yes, um, with some saying no, some saying not sure. Yep, it's a, it's going to be something that schools are going to have to discuss and develop a policy for because the law does not require that they do anything um, differently. And, you know, it is a policy question for schools. So the indirect changes to charitable giving that we expect to have an effect on schools, um, the most significant impact overall comes from changes uh, that were made to the corporate, individual, and estate tax rules that could reduce the incentive for donors to give. 
The Tax Policy Center estimates that charitable giving will decline by 12 to $20 billion annually out of approximately $282 billion in individual annual contributions, so that's about 4 to 7 percent. However, the individual provisions in the TCJA are currently set to expire in 2025, so the not-too-distant future could bring about additional changes, and all of these estimates depend on individual behavior, which we truly can't accurately assess. Some donors will continue to give regardless of tax benefits, and we expect that most parents will continue to support their children's schools, but other donors may reduce charitable contributions when there's no specific economic incentive to make them. So we've already discussed the corporate tax rate change, which may affect corporate giving. Corporations are allowed to deduct up to 10% of their taxable income as charitable contributions each year, and excess charitable contributions have a five-year carryover period after which they're lost. Corporations with low taxable income may be incentivized to increase contributions, while those with high taxable income may be discouraged. On the other hand, corporations with high taxable income will enjoy a tax savings that will provide more disposable cash, which they could use for pretty much anything they want to. Development departments may find this a good opportunity to ask corporations who are saving money on taxes to give back to their communities through charitable giving, as we've seen suggest suggestions that companies increase worker wages with their tax savings. So there's opportunities to at least make a request. Um, so we'll discuss the individual changes in a little more detail and some ideas for development departments about how they can respond in the next couple of slides. The income-based limitation for cash contributions to public charities is increasing from 50% to 60% of the donor's adjusted gross income. The provision retains the five-year carryover period for excess charitable contributions, and for some donors, this will provide additional opportunities for current giving because of the increased limitation. Normally, we would expect this change in uh, this increase in overall charitable giving by individuals, or we, we would expect to see an increase in overall giving. However, we also have to consider the following changes. The TCJA doubles the standard deduction, which will undoubtedly make tax filing for many families significantly easier. However, it also means that many more people will no longer need to track and deduct their charitable contributions. The limit on de deducting state and property taxes um, has been, it's been limited to 10%, 10% combined, um, and it's gathered a lot of press in states with higher state and local tax rates, such as California. In addition to the increased standard deduction, far fewer individuals will be able to itemize deductions as the state tax deduction alone may have qualified them in previous years. Deductible interest on a home mortgage will be limited to the first $750,000 of acquisition indebtedness for homes purchased after 2017, which means that most home buyers in high cost of living areas like Los Angeles or the Bay Area will no longer be able to deduct all of their mortgage interest. Interest on home equity lines of credit is no longer deductible at all. Additionally, miscellaneous itemized deductions have been eliminated, eliminated. so these are deductions that were previously subject to the 2% of AGI threshold, such as investment advisor expenses, income tax preparation expenses, unreimbursed employee expenses, casualty losses, gambling losses, etc. All of these pressures add to the number of people who, were, who will no longer be able to itemize deductions and so who will no longer benefit financially from making charitable contributions, and most likely those who were donors in the $1,000 to $5,000 range annually. So for larger donors, we expect this to have less of an impact, but for smaller donors, we expect it to be much more significant. So in terms of development opportunities and challenges, um, we expect to see the biggest donor behavioral changes in those donors who previously qualified to itemize deductions but who, who will no longer qualify, as we just talked about. It seems most likely to affect individuals whose annual giving was, again, in that range of $5,000 or less. These donors may not have an economic incentive to give charitable donations, so it will be really important to convey to these donors how essential their gifts are to the operations of your school even if there's no tax benefit to the gift. For corporate sponsors, development departments can think of mentioning the lower corporate tax rate and donation appeals, and likewise, they could increase their charitable giving with funds they're saving, uh, the corporations can increase their charitable giving with the funds they're saving on income taxes. Corporate, 
I'm sorry, this is repetitive. So this can be a good opportunity to remind companies that um, might be feeling a little flush with funds that they have the chance to make a real difference in their communities by supporting local schools and other charities. One strategy for donors who may be on the cusp of being able to itemize deductions is to stagger gifts so that this, the donor is able to itemize every other tax year. So assuming that a donor has consistent giving behavior each year, they may choose to pay out their annual contributions every other year so that they can itemize and take tax benefits from their gifts. So for example, let's say the donor decides to take the standard deduction in 2018. So they'll hold on to the cash for all of their charitable gifts throughout the year and then actually make payment in January of 2019. They would then make their normally scheduled 2019 gifts, which would double their charitable deduction and allow them to itemize in 2019. The donor would then hold all donations in 2020 and take the standard deduction that year and then pay out their charitable gifts for both 2020 and 2021 in 2021. So they're itemizing in odd years, they're saving the money in even years, and it allows them to um, itemize in the odd years and then take the standard deduction in the even years. Um, so this can help donors who otherwise might not qualify to itemize in any tax year to receive a benefit of additional deductions every other year. Donor advised funds may also be used as a tool to time charitable deductions because gifts to a donor advised fund are tax deductible to the donor in the year of the gift, but the donor can direct payouts from the donor advised fund in future years. So if there's a long term giving strategy in place, the donor can put the funds into a donor advised fund up front. And they can take the tax deduction in a year where they itemize deductions and then they can pay out their planned gifts in future years when they might not qualify to itemize. Overall, the new tax law adds to the increasingly complex business environment schools have to navigate. And unfortunately, for those of us who love to plan, much of the anticipated changes in donor behavior is impossible to accurately predict. The TCJA only changed the individual provisions for the next eight years, so unless the law is changed again, they will all be phased out and the old rules will come back. So we'll have to see what the impact is to our donor populations, but we expect to have conditions change again pretty quickly. So we just have to be ready to respond uh, to really any sort of changing environment and remember to try and stay nimble. Um, several high income states, including California, have proposed legislation to counteract the effect of the federal limit on state and local tax deductions. And the idea circulating in the California legislature right now would allow people to choose to pay their state income tax to a new charitable organization called the California Excellence Fund instead of to the Franchise Tax Board. So the payment would qualify as a charitable donation instead of a tax payment. And then the way this would work is you would receive a dollar for dollar voucher from the California Excellence Fund, which could be used against your tax liability on your tax return. Um, and so you take the charitable deduction for the tax payment, which then zeroes out your tax. Um, there's a proposal in New Jersey to eliminate the individual income tax and replace it with a payroll tax. But really with both of these plans, there would be a lot to figure out. It would be really easy for the IRS to disallow the type of deduction proposed by California just by issuing a new regulation that would close it, close the option and say, you know, there's no such thing as a dollar for dollar voucher you know, you're receiving a benefit in return for your charitable deduction, so it's not charitable. Um, and then for New Jersey, where people may often work in one state and live in another, there could be far-reaching consequences to individuals who live outside of New Jersey and would still be subject to income tax in their state, but who work in New Jersey and would therefore also be subject to the new payroll tax. So there's lots to think about in the coming months and lots of issues that we'll kind of just have to wait and see how they turn out. Thanks, Katie. On to polling question number four. So if you've missed any of the prior polling questions, um, make sure you take a look at the this one. Will your development department change its strategy in response to the tax law changes? A yes, B no, or C not sure. And get those answers in. We'll close the poll in three two, and one. It looks like everybody else, most people aren't sure what development's gonna do just yet. <laughs> it's early. So I've got a few questions to answer here. Um, one of them says, are you saying that because California does not allow a tax deduction for state income tax, 
um, to state income tax for a 529 plan contribution that the short-term savings enjoyed in other states aren't available here and that only the tax-free interest used to pay tuition is a benefit if used for primary or secondary tuition. Yes, um, because there's not a state tax, a state income tax deduction for these contributions, um, really the main benefit that you're going to be getting is the long-term opportunity to have the savings grow tax-free and then be able to take them out um, without consequence, without penalty or um, having to pay tax on the, on the growth that was in the account. Um, and then somebody also said, in the state of California, if parents use the 529 to pay tuition, will they pay a penalty and a state tax on the capital gains? Uh, we don't have any guidance on that quite yet. Um, I would assume that they will conform, but the Franchise Tax Board is famously slow to conform to federal regulation changes, so it may not be this year. Um, we'll have to wait and see what the FTB does, but I don't know that yet. Um, we also had another question regarding tuition remission for highly compensated employees. Um, there hasn't been a change to that item yet um, that we've seen. Generally, if you've got a, a tuition remission plan that favors highly compensated employees, it's not excludable from their income um, unless you have a, a plan. That, generally, the plans have to not discriminate toward executives and highly compensated employees. Um, there hasn't been any change to that, so um, if you have specifics that you want us to look at, um, just drop us an email or something and we would be happy to help. And Martha, I know you're you're on and I know you wanted to say a few words toward the end of the webinar. Um, are you hearing any particular questions or specific things from our California schools that you might have Katie answer now? We've got a little bit of time. No, I think the biggest topic was just the 529s, and I think Katie's correct. It's a school policy issue, and, um, and I think Katie also right, rightly covered the fact that we really can't give tax advice. So um, there's just a lot of questions, and, you know, obviously because I'm a former advancement director, <laughs> Um, I actually am pretty optimistic that, that people are going to give to their kids' schools regardless. Um, but it may be interesting to see, you know, like, um, with capital campaigns, mm -hmm. a lot of those payments have been spread over four, three, four years, and it may not be advantageous to do that anymore. So it's just uh, it's something that I'm going to be interested in in what schools do, but I think the other question, I think people are kind of waiting with bated breath to see if some of the things that were excluded from this particular tax bill somehow um, rear their ugly heads again in the future. So it's just a and lot of unanswered. <laughs> yes. Unanswered questions. Yes, definitely. And Katie, do you, I mean, if, if there was maybe, you know, three pieces of advice you might give some folks listening right now, or even two, maybe one, you, but <laughs> basically what do you kind of, I mean, you went over a lot of technical stuff today yes. and you know, what is, what are kind of the key takeaways that you want folks to walk away with? Um, you know, come talk to us, come talk to your tax advisor, but anything else that you want them to know? I think you're going to have a lot of questions from parents about 529 plans and, you know, we've said it a couple of times, but the biggest um, advice that we can give you there is have them go to their tax person. It's definitely not your role to provide them with tax advice or, um, and there's nothing in the law that puts you in a position to need to give any advice, any statements, anything like that to parents. So when when they take these their funds out of this plan, in order to prove that it was for qualifying expenses, they can just use their regular tuition bill they don't have to have any special statement from you. Colleges have to issue a 1098T for tuition payments. Schools don't have to do that. There's no need to, to develop a new statement that you're going to give out to parents. Um, so in that sense, this is really more of an individual provision that is going to affect the parents more than the schools. If you're thinking about looking at 529 plan assets for financial aid, 
um, there are you know pluses and minuses to including that in the calculation as as a matter of policy one of those is that they are really designed for long-term savings for college tuition expenses and if parents have to ha are kind of required to pay that down during the k-12 through years there's a lot less remaining for college years which was the original intention when they set this up obviously because when they set the plan up, unless they do it right now, they didn't know that it was gonna be available for K through 12. So the long-term effects of drawing down those plan funds means one, you have less tax-free growth in the plan, and two, they're, they're suddenly being required to use what they thought was college savings toward K through 12, or they can't be considered eligible for financial aid based on those funds. So it's something to consider for schools, definitely. Um, and it looks like we've actually got a couple of questions that have come in, um, and one on your favorite topic of bond Ooh, financing. My favorite. Um, it, it question is, um, the, you mentioned the facilities that are funded through the ta tax-exempt bond aren't usable uh, by for-profit companies. If a school has multiple buildings, are only those funded by the tax-exempt bond loan out of bounds? and the other buildings available for use by the for-profit entity, for example, summer camps or enrichment programs. Yes, and there is um, kind of a whole industry around allocating buildings for financing. So if, to the extent that the building has equity in it and you don't owe on the bond anymore, then you can take a percentage of the total and that whittles down your 5%. If you say my bond financing only covers these five academic buildings and then the playground and the you know parking lot and the athletic facilities all of that is equity and you've allocated that out you can kind of carve out the section that's going to be bond financed and make sure that that's only used for your exact purpose and then you can have the rest that is equity owned you can use for other purposes and not have the private business use exception awesome and it looks like we've got one more question and then we can probably wrap it up for today for employees who are concerned about their withholdings and how the tax act will affect them next spring, is there a reliable source that we can point them to in order to determine what their withholding should be? Uh, there are some new withholding tables that just came out. Um, I believe Armanino notified us of them yesterday as employees and said, as of February, you're gonna have the new withholding tables applying to your payroll. So. They're go they wanted to make sure that they could continue to use the same W-4s that you already have on file from your employees. So you shouldn't have to change, employees should not have to redo their W-4 to say how much they wanna have withheld. The tables have kind of been designed to address that from the IRS's side. So there should you should see the new tables coming out through your payroll providers in the coming weeks. And um, hopefully, <laughs> there has been a lot of press about this too, that they're not exactly sure how this is gonna turn out. They think that the withholding tables will be pretty accurate, but it's kind of a um, trial by fire in terms of figuring out whether it's actually gonna be accurate at the end of the year. You can always have, um, as an employee, if you're afraid that it's not gonna cover your liability, you can always ask to have extra withheld. Um, but even me personally, I'm still waiting to see what the first payroll looks like <laughs> before I make any changes. So um, as we get more information about that, if you've got specific questions, again, please reach out to us. Perfect. Martha, any closing words? No, no closing words. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm just happy that there are many fewer issues to cover on this than we first feared in the fall. Yes. Um, that's the good news. Definitely. Perfect. We love to end on a good note. So if any other questions do come up, please do reach out to Katie, Dean, Martha. Um, we'll be sending out an email again within a couple of days with the recording and the slide deck. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Calis Boa for partnering with us on this webinar. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you at a future event. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you.